Mount Carmel is located about nine miles or 15 kilometers east of the Mediterranean Sea in the Carmel Mountain Range, which is in the northern part of Israel. It's also about 28 miles or 44 kilometers southwest of the Sea of Galilee. It has a spectacular view of the Jezreel Valley, which is also known as the Valley of Armageddon. Armageddon is where part of the last battle on earth takes place at the end of the Great Tribulation period. From Mount Carmel, you can see Nazareth, Cana, Megiddo, the Jezreel Valley, and the Kishon Stream, where Elijah went down and slaughtered the 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah after the great showdown that took place on top of Mount Carmel. And also you can see the Mediterranean Sea from this place. And yet another very lovely evening out there to all of you, my dear friends. I thought that I would update this Mount Carmel showdown. And uh, we've already went over a couple of years back the entire life of Elijah the prophet. We were introduced to Elijah the Tishbite in the previous chapter, where we're told how he confronts Ahab and Jezebel, the king and queen of the northern tribes of Israel. heavy idolatry all over the place. And Elijah, he's told by the Lord to confront them, tell them because they've been in such apostasy for so long, and it's reached really this peak of evil by this point. And uh, they've just become totally corrupt. And God says, go and tell them there'll be no rain on the earth for three and a half years. So Elijah does that. And then He's told to flee outside of the reach of Ahab and Jezebel from Samaria, where he confronts them initially, to the brook Kareth, right not very far away at all from where he was actually from. He's called Elijah the Tishbite, and it's at that point where he's fed by the ravens, and then after about six months or so, he's told by the Lord to go into Zarephath because the brook actually dries up due to the heavy drought upon the land. So he flees unto Zarephath. Ironically, this is also the very same area where Jezebel was initially born at, and it's there that he finds the widow picking up sticks, and she says, we're about to die, me and my son, because they have no money in the drought. It's many, many people are suffering at this time. And God tells Elijah to stay with her and her son, and they'll all be safe throughout the famine. So that's what they do. You can go. We go over the details and the other First uh, Kings seventeen study, but just to catch us all up, and that's where we come to with First Kings eighteen verse one. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, "Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth." So just to clarify, here in verse one, we're told that after three years, Elijah is told go back and tell them that rain will now be sent upon the earth. Adam Clark noted, probably Elijah spent six months at the brook Kareth and three years with the widow at Sarepta. F.B. Meyer commented on the dire state of the land at that time. The people, the whole land seemed apostate, turned away from God in fear of Jezebel and Ahab. Of all the thousands of Israel, only 7,000 remained who had not bowed the knee or kissed the hand to Baal. But they, the 7,000 even, were paralyzed with fear and kept so still that their very existence was unknown by Elijah in the hour of his great loneliness. Verse 2, And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab the king, and there was a sore famine in Samaria, the capital. Now, remember, all the other prophets are in hiding, but the most wanted of them, the most hated of them, Elijah, the one that... Jezebel is wanting to kill the most, and Ahab as well. Not only is he told, come out of hiding, God says, now go find Ahab. And I do totally agree with David Guzik on this. Ahab believed, most likely, 
Ahab believed that Elijah had angered the sky god Baal, and therefore Baal withheld rain. Ahab probably thought that Baal would hold back the rain until Elijah was caught and executed. Because remember, the whole nation, the government sanctified religion was Baal worship. And if you didn't worship Baal, you were hunted down and killed. Ahab should have turned to the word of God. Deuteronomy 28 actually states a promise that drought would come to a disobedient Israel. So Elijah's making his way to find Ahab, verse 3, and Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets secretly and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. One can only imagine how scarce bread and water both were at this time, and yet Obadiah risked much, even his very life, in order to feed these followers of God. Now, prophets in the sense, this is a very broad term, these were not prophets like Elijah. They were people like preachers, evangelists. Verse 5, And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all fountains of water, and unto all brooks, peradventure, maybe, we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beast. Which is truly very telling of the desperation of that time. Cambridge noted, we can see the grievous necessity the land was in when the king himself goes forth on such a quest. No one, save the two chief persons in the realm, could be trusted to make this all-important search, because if anyone else found water, they may take it for themselves. But it also says something that Ahab is searching for water for his horses and the beast. F.B. Meyer commented, we might have supposed that he would set himself to alleviate the miseries of his people, and above all, that he would have turned back to God, but no. His one thought was about the horses and mules of his stud. His only care was to save some of them alive. What selfishness is here? Mules and asses before his people, seeking for grass instead of seeking for God. Verse 6, so the king, he orders his governor to go one way and he'll go the other. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it, Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face, and said, Art thou that my lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy lord, behold, Elijah is here. And Obadiah replied, What have I sinned, that thou wouldst deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom, where my lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said, He is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. Charles Ellicott made a really good note at this point. This unremitting search, he spared no expense to try to find Elijah. Implying perhaps some supremacy or authority over neighboring nations or kingdoms throughout. Suits ill with the half-hearted enmity of Ahab. Ahab was known to be a very weak king. No doubt it was the work of Jezebel in Ahab's name, connived at, as in the murder of Naboth, by his timidity. Verse 11, So Obadiah, he's worried that if he obeys Elijah and he goes and says, O king, I've found Elijah, he's afraid that whenever the king comes to see that Elijah's going to be led away somewhere else by the Lord. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, and he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water? And now thou sayest, Go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And Elijah replied, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now notice the plural form of Baal is used right here, Balaam. That's actually very telling. The plural Balaam is used because there were many forms or aspects of Baal. 
so that he was worshipped under several names at different places at Bel Berith, Bel Zebub, Bel Peor, and Ahab, in compliance with the will of Jezebel, had admitted them all into Israel. Verse 19, Elijah still speaking, Now therefore send, and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves, four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. Now notice how we're only told about the former show up, the 450 prophets of Baal. We're not told about the additional 400 being there. The prophets of the groves, in other words, Asherah, these being probably the devotees of the female deity Astarte, seem to have been especially favored by the queen. It is, however, to be noted that, in spite of Elijah's challenge, they do not appear all in the subsequent scene. And in case you're wondering, people still worship idols among groves today. Verse 20, So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. Now if you'll notice, Mount Carmel is located about 14 miles or so from this Jezreel, which became a prominent city at the time of Ahab and Jezebel. They're, they're the ones that actually made it so prominent. But it's quite a distance away from Jezebel. And it would have taken a little bit of time in order to gather, not literally all of the people of Israel, many of them just trying to survive. But Elijah was almost certainly referring to the representatives of the people. This would have still been thousands, an enormous crowd. Verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Now this is staggering. One man, out of all the prophets, out of all the people of Israel, even out of all the people of Judah, none of them even stood up against such apostasy. But one man stands alone against all of them, God strengthening him every moment. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are four hundred and fifty men. Once again, no mention of the four hundred prophets of the grove. He opposes himself only to these four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal, because it seems these only were present, the prophets of the groves not being permitted by Jezebel, it seems, through her pride and obstinacy, or care and kindness to them, to go as far from the royal city as Carmel. Verse 23, Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. Pay close attention to this. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. Many ancient historians recorded how deceit was largely practiced in the heathen temples, and sacrifices represented as miraculously consumed, for the accomplishment of which preparation was made in the ground beneath the altar. And the very same trickery is used today. It's only this weeping Mary statues and all of this. But do keep this thought process of Elijah's in mind. He says no trickery whatsoever, because this is going to be brought up throughout this showdown. Verse 24, And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon. So they did this for hours, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. Notice they're going on for hours and hours, and then become even more fervent and more fervent, because they think they're going to be heard for their much speaking. Like Jesus said, it has been obvious to see in their extreme exercise in prayer an illustration of our Lord's condemnation of the worship of the heathen who think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Verse 27, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth, and must be awaked. Now, as you'll see right here, an actual image of one of the old Baal statues from back then, so they were crying out to this thing for hours and hours. It is, Charles Ellicott noted once again, it is the bitter irony that Elijah's doing right here. It is the bitter irony of sheer contempt calling Baal a god, only to heap upon him ideas most ungodlike. He is busy, or he is in retirement. He is far away, or in the noonday heat, he is asleep. Verse 28, now one can only 
picture the scene right here because the more people that are in a frenzy, the greater the frenzy grows. It's kind of like if you see a rock concert and they start up a mosh pit and then they start going crazy and, you know, jumping and running all over one another. The crazier somebody gets, the crazier the other person gets. And so this is also disproving the existence of their God and whom they've dedicated their entire beings to. They're prophets of Baal. This isn't just worshipers of Baal, but prophets of him. Verse 28, And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Now, real quick, do take notice of how they're cutting themselves. Well, we know of someone else doing this very same act in the New Testament, the demoniac that meets Christ. Mark 5, And when Jesus was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And do remember in Leviticus 19, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Now notice me, I'm one to talk, you know. I have 30 plus tattoos, but all of these were from before I got saved. Ten years ago, I stopped getting them. But before then, I had placed 30 plus tattoos all over my body. Verse 29, And it came to pass, when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. Now notice very quickly how it states how they prophesied. Now this is not the same type of prophesying that Elijah did. Do recall King Saul back in the days of David, whenever he was beginning to be exalted in the land? 1 Samuel 18, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied. Saul prophesied as well, just like these pagans. In the midst of the house, and David played with his hand, as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. Once again, Ellicott noted how Saul was in a state of frenzy, unable to master himself, speaking words of which he knew not the meaning and acted like a man possessed. How often does that happen right in the midst of churches today? People speak things and no one has a clue what they're saying. It could easily be demonic voices coming out of them. And just look at how in a state of frenzy that they are. Now, this is modern day in mega churches. Now, this is not of God, my friends. Okay, let's continue. Verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. Now that is a big trench, my friends. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. Now, in case you're wondering where this water is coming from, do remember that Mount Carmel was located near the brook Kishon as well as the sea. And we're about to find out just right here in a few seconds how in Elijah's prayer, he prays to the Lord and he says, I have done all that you have told me. So it's the Lord that ordered all of these steps. But why all this water? Elijah showed no trickery could be practiced in the present case. Had there been a concealed fire under the altar, the water that was thrown on the altar must have extinguished it most effectually. And you may be thinking, well, that's unnecessary because the fire comes from heaven and strikes the altar. Yeah, but many of the people who aren't there to witness this, they would probably claim that Elijah would use some other kind of trickery in order to have completely obliterated this sacrifice because there's going to be a huge mark in the earth. And I'll show an illustration of what I'm meaning right here because this fire from heaven absolutely decimates every bit of this. It doesn't just light the sacrifice. It, It just absolutely annihilates every bit of what Elijah's building right here. Verse 35, And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that Thou art the Lord God, and that Thou hast turned their heart back again. Ah! 
The Lord is God. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. What an absolutely unforgettable and jarring display of power right here. So monumental that here we are some 2,800 years or so later, still talking about this very moment. Everything had been leading up to this moment. Israel's many decades of incessant backsliding had forced the Lord to take quite drastic measures. A three and a half years long drought had ruined the land. Persecution of God's people had been amplified to heights never before imagined apostasy was at an all-time high all the while heaven seemingly remained quiet as demon worship swept the holy land however as we now read the prolonged silence played a great part in the great revival about to commence at mount carmel one can only imagine how dreadful the sight must have been how terrifying to think of god delaying his presence among the people for so long until this single event in which the creator of the sun itself sent a sudden burst of searing fire from the sky directly into the midst of these unexpected observers and do take careful notice their immediate reaction including elijah himself is one of utter fright shock and frenzy Verse 39, And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, which is right below the mount, and slew them there. Now there are many valid reasons why this execution of the false prophets of Baal needed to take place. But the very same logic which was applied to the water on the sacrifice and Elijah's public prayer to the one living God publicly to make known that this is God doing this is also applied to the slaughter of these prophets of Baal. You say, well, I don't get that. What are you talking about? Namely, to erase any thoughts that the oncoming miraculous rain came from anyone except the Lord God. See, the rain is about to come. And these prophets of Baal are going to be done away with, so... Baal is not going to take any credit for this. Everyone is going to know God not only sent the fire, but now he's about to send the rain. Verse 41, so these false prophets, they've all been executed, 450 of them. And Elijah said unto Ahab, now it's not begun to rain yet. And Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there's a sound of abundance of rain. Now this is his prophetic sense speaking because there's not even a cloud in the sky right now. But what is the meaning behind what he's saying to Ahab? Get thee up, eat and drink, and all of this. Cambridge commented, It would seem as if Elijah had not yet despaired of Ahab. He hadn't totally given up on him, and was giving the king, who must have been paralyzed by the scene, the best advice for his present need after the long and tragic day. It's thought that the king had a tent nearby, and Elijah's telling him, You might want to eat and gather your strength, because you're about to have to ride on that chariot 14 miles to Jezreel. That's not a very short distance, really. The words may also imply that now there was no longer any fear of want, for the rain was coming at once. Thus, they would form a fit introduction for the announcement which follows. Verse 42, So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again seven times. Now there is a quick and important lesson to be learned right here real quick. Charles Ellicott noted how from this delay of the answer to prayer, Elijah's example became proverbial for intensity and perseverance in supplication. If you'll remember, this very moment is mentioned in the New Testament book of James to pray through, as we say. The contrast is remarkable between the immediate answer to his earlier prayer and the long delay here. And I agree with Ellicott on how the one was for the sake of the people, the first one. The other for some lesson, perhaps of humility and patience to Elijah himself. When the answer does come, it fulfills itself speedily. The little cloud becomes all but immediately a storm blackening the whole heavens, borne by a hurricane from the west, most likely. 
Verse 44, And it came to pass at the seventh time that the servant said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And now notice the actions of Elijah. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now it's not as if Elijah is trying to outrun the rain and race Ahab and try to get in front of him. No, he's actually kind of guiding Ahab, leading him, if you will, to show how ready he was to honor and serve the king, that by this humble and self-denying carriage, it might appear what he had done was not from envy or passion, but only from a just zeal for God's glory, that by his presence with the king and his courtiers, he might animate and oblige them to proceed in the reformation of religion and to demonstrate that he was neither ashamed of nor afraid for what he had done, but did venture himself in the midst of his own enemies. Remember, Jezebel is located at Jezreel, and yet Elijah still, that's the first place he heads. He wants a great revival to happen, for God's sake. Remember, there's still a bounty on Elijah's head. 